see on my screen here. Uh, welcome back to this meeting um, of the Mid Atlantic Fishery Management Council, along with the Atlantic States Commission Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass Board. Uh, I will be joined by my co chair, uh, Mr. Adam Nowalski, as board chair for this discussion. And um, I'm sorry that we went a little over on our previous agenda item and but I do want to offer all the opportunity and time for uh, this discussion here today. Brandon, I, I, I saw that you just tested your audio. Are you are you ready to go on this? Ready when you are, Mr. Chairman. OK, yeah, so let's go ahead and jump right into the. Um, right into the presentation and then there'll be an opportunity for questions, comments and uh, public comment regarding the presentation that Brandon has for us today. So uh, thanks for being here with us today, Brandon, and I look forward to the discussion. I, I saw the uh, the one slide that you had, which is like my favorite slide with with it's like a wormhole kind of thing where <laughs> there's so much to it, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you have uh, for us today and it's all you whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> Glad to uh, keep bringing up uh, pictures that everybody likes. So, so thank you, everybody. I appreciate the time today, and I think you'll you'll find a lot of the topics that you've actually talked about yesterday and today during the specifications discussions and some of the discard issues there, and, and certainly your discussion earlier this morning regarding the harvest control rule. I think you'll see a lot of that folded into some of the issues and concepts that we'll be considering through the management strategy evaluation. Um, there's a lot of work that's already gone on to the management strategy evaluation project. We've actually been working on it for a little over a year now already, but this is actually the first time we're meeting jointly with the board for me to give this presentation. We've tried to structure it around when the board has been meeting. So I, you know, I'm, I'm planning to give a little bit of background I'm certainly not going to go into all of the details of what's taken place so far. Really, my focus today is on the feedback that we've received from stakeholders and a core stakeholder group that we've formed for this project. And so I would just, you know, encourage people to go. We have a management strategy evaluation page on the council's website that has a ton of more details, lots of documents and things that you can dive into to look at some of the data elements that we've collected already. Um, if you're interested in some of the additional details on some of those things. Okay, and as I typically do with my EAFM projects um, is start off with this slide in regards to the council's EAFM decision framework. This will probably be the last time I show this slide, at least in regards to this particular topic again, but since since we may have some new folks on board, I think it's good to at least take a step back and understand why we're doing management strategy evaluation and how we got ourselves you know, to this point that we're at today. And so really this is just the councils through the EAFM guidance document. This is the approach they decided on in terms of how they would incorporate ecosystem information into their current single species framework. And so it was this very deliberative process to step through um, developing ecosystem information and how we could ultimately funnel it into, um, you know, management decisions uh, in the future. And so the first step was to prioritize what are the risks to our council fisheries and to our fisheries management process. And through that, we conducted a risk assessment in 2017, where summer flounder was determined to be the, the fishery we would focus in on. And so now that we had our priority species we were going to evaluate, the second step was to refine, like, what's the real issues that we're trying to understand here? What, what are the management questions we want to consider? And so that was the conceptual model development where we identified the summer flounder ecosystem and all the components that may be driving uh, stock dynamics and fishery dynamics um, within the summer flounder ecosystem to come up with a series of management questions for council consideration. And ultimately, from that, we're moving into the analysis component, which is conducting a management strategy evaluation, taking the management question we determined out of the conceptual model, and we're going to develop that. So, like I said, we started this in 2020. 
We're going to work on this through the rest of this year and bring this project to a completion next year. And so here's Mr. Chairman's favorite figure. And actually, this is an interactive figure. It's not interactive on this slide, but there are different moving parts to this conceptual model. And I won't get into that here, but this is really to show um, sort of that the council decided we presented a series of questions that the council may want to consider and ultimately they decided on a question that will evaluate the biological and economic benefits of minimizing summer flounder discards, both live and dead, and converting those discards into landings in the recreational sector. And they also wanted to identify management strategies to effectively realize these benefits. And so this figure here on the right just shows, since this is an EAFM process, this is not just something regarding summer flounder, it's thinking about things more holistically than we have in the past. That, that conceptual model there on the left-hand side shows all the connections that discards has throughout the summer flounder ecosystem. So it certainly has implications for the stock. It has implications for the for fisheries and it has implications for management. So that does have all of these different connections to it throughout the ecosystem. And when the council selected this question, they thought it was a really good opportunity to align our ecosystem work with our traditional management processes. Like I said, you, the last day and a half, you've already been talking about discards and ways to address those things, this, the data concerns or the data quality behind those discard estimates and how we account for them within our management process. So it's a real wet, good way to sort of align those things that you're already doing within an ecosystem approach. It addresses the council's research priorities, which is to address uh, discards, particularly regulatory discards and how we can minimize them. But this gave us an opportunity to do this in a different way, um, really evaluate the sort of the trade offs and the implications of different management policies through this management strategy evaluation process. Like I said, and this is really is an EAFM consideration. And I think you'll see that as we develop, go through the presentation today, when we look at objectives and strategies for this project. And so why, why do we want to do a management strategy evaluation and what are the benefits of going through this process? I said, and it's really a tool to allow us to test different strategies, test different regulations and their ability to achieve specified management objectives before we implement them, right? So we can run through a number of simulations if we were to implement a particular series of regulations what those implications may mean from a discarding perspective, from a effort and economic benefits. So we can evaluate all of these different trade-offs and strategies and try to see how our management you know, actions may support the objectives that we're trying to achieve here. And so different than the conceptual model where we actually just developed this visualization tool to look at ecosystem factors throughout the summer flounder ecosystem, here we're actually going to develop quantitative models. And so we're, we have two models that are under development. One is a, a biological sort of population simulation model. That's our sort of baseline model. And then we also will have a bioeconomic model so that will evaluate different um, management strategies, feedback into the population model, see what, you know, as we implement different um, management strategies, what are the implications both from a biological and a economic perspective. But this whole process won't necessarily specify one particular outcome or strategy to achieve all of our objectives. As you'll see later, we have a very broad objectives um, that we're going to be considering here. There isn't going to be one silver bullet that's going to accomplish everything. There may be multiple um, outcomes here to achieve the objectives that are most important to the council and the board. And so it's, it's really going to be a way to evaluate what are sort of trade-offs we're willing to make to achieve those different objectives. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on the next part of my presentation is really this inclusive stakeholder process that we've engaged in. That's been the last year has really been stakeholder engagement to really bring them on board early to help the council and board identify clear objectives and strategies for you all to be considering. 
And so, again, I won't go into the details of each of these, but I will touch upon all of them because all of this information helped us identify the draft objectives and alternatives that I'll go through in detail later. And so all of these stakeholder engagement opportunities gave us the ability to develop this really wide range of objectives and alternatives for your consideration. And um, so we have four different uh, stakeholder engagement opportunities that we had, each one sort of fed upon each other. So the information we gained from our previous stakeholder engagement process helped inform and, and move on to the next engagement process. And the, the benefits or the goal here was really to get stakeholder input early and throughout the entire process. So that we're gonna have continued engagement all the way into the end of this project. And I think that's really critical that we got folks, we got input early on before we were making any management decisions and we're gonna have them engaged all the way until the end. And just quickly, this was something I had mentioned a while ago. We also brought on a, um, a facilitator to help us make sure that we are maximizing our stakeholder input. It was a recommendation from from other councils that I've spoken to that have gone through management strategy evaluation was bringing on a facilitator to, to help with this, these types of projects, making sure that that person is independent from outside the region. They don't have a stake in the game in terms of what the particular outcomes are. They are really there to just help facilitate stakeholder input and make sure we're getting everything that we need to get. And this facilitator works very closely with the technical work group in terms of you know, providing all that feedback back to the work group in terms of future analyses to be to run. And certainly uh, this facilitator plays a big role with our core stakeholder group that I'll get into in a few slides. So again, just real quickly, just to give you a sense of the types of engagement that we've had. Last September, we held a, a kickoff webinar and mock workshop with our EOP and council Summer Flounder and Black Sea Bass AP, and also the Commission's Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass AP. You know, initially, I think the technical work group thought that most of our engagement would occur from our AP members, and to some regards, that's true. But um, as you'll see, as we we thought about additional ways to get a broader input from from folks other than just our APs. And so we held this meeting last September, and it was really to introduce our AP members to a management strategy evaluation, what those concepts are, what the process will be, what the expectations uh, of the process would be, because you know, we haven't gone through this kind of type of detailed management strategy evaluation before within the Mid-Atlantic. And there's been mixed reviews about sort of the, the outcomes and how things went in, in other areas. And so we thought it would be really wise to invest time in sort of you know, sort of introducing these concepts to our advisory panel members. And we also simulated a, a mock workshop just to get folks familiar with how things would, would, would be run going forward. And so after that, earlier this year, we held an online stakeholder feedback survey where we solicited input from anybody that wanted to participate and get some of their feedback. The survey had a series of both mandatory uh, and optional questions, closed-ended um, questions, and open-ended questions. Um, we were looking for feedback on, on stakeholders' concerns about the summer flounder fishery, what they think our management objectives would, should be, what strategies should we implement to achieve those objectives, what data might be out there that uh, the technical work group may be unfamiliar with and identify sort of those unknowns. What are the other driving forces within the fishery that we should be thinking about? And we also, and this will be a theme through all of these, we solicited in, um, in information about whether or not folks wanna join this core stakeholder group. And so the response to this scoping survey, online scoping survey was really um, phenomenal. We got 818 individual responses from at least one state from, from Massachusetts and North Carolina. Um, we were able to get additional demographic information on a subset of those uh, 818 folks so we could look at responses from a regional and state specific perspective. So that was really uh, informative and all of those sort of detailed responses from those surveys can be found on that management strategy evaluation page 
And we actually just included a, a new piece to our webpage where, you, where folks can dive into responses to all the different questions by, by state, by region, by stakeholder type. You can see what um, feedback was by the different stakeholders. So it's a really sort of interactive tool that you can find on that management strategy evaluation webpage. After that, we held a series of regional workshops, um, webinar workshops. These were held in late March and early April. So right before our April council meeting was our, our last uh, regional workshop. Again, these were, we had very similar topics that we were gonna cover uh, with uh, during these workshops that we held with the online stakeholder survey. But it, it allowed us, holding these workshops allowed us to have things in a little bit more structured setting and certainly more interactive than just an online survey. So uh, it was really informative to, even though the attendance was fairly light across all three workshops, um, you know, the feedback that we did get was very similar to the online survey that we got, but we were allowed to sort of dive into some of these, the um, sort of feedback that we did get and sort of pull out some nuances that we were missing within the uh, scoping survey. So it was a really, even though it was lightly attended, I think the feedback and the input that we did get was really informative during these workshops. So we took all of that information and from broad stakeholders, but we realized that we can't keep getting input from a broad group because it's really challenging. It's inefficient to continue to collect information that way. So we really wanted to move to more focused and a smaller group to really help us guide us through this, the rest of the management strategy evaluation process. And we wanted to identify a specific group instead of, um, and that group would be the group to help us go through the rest of this process versus just sort of rotating through different stakeholders that may participate early, but they can't participate late. We wanna make sure we had a consistent group of folks that would stay engaged through the rest of the process. And this group is gonna serve as the main source of input to the technical work group and to you all in defining project goals. They're gonna evaluate the model and different considerations there, and they're gonna provide general feedback on the outcomes when we get to the end of the project. And so this core group, we are looking to have anywhere from 12 to 15 participants representing the range of fishery perspectives. We also were going to, we were asking core stakeholder participants, certainly we want them to bring their ideas, have an open mind to the process, because this is going to be very different than what most folks are typically used to when they're engaged in a council or board process. And we're looking for them to be supportive of the process at the end. We know that um, you know, not everybody is going to support the final answer per se, or what sort of management actions that you all may select at the end, but at least they're going to support the process and the approach that we took to get to those and the information that we're providing to you all at the end. And this is really a big commitment for four folks. We're asking them to participate in these in a series of three stakeholder workshops. And it's not just those workshops too. We're giving them plenty of homework um, to do prior to our workshops and in between. So there's a lot of work for these folks. And so far they've been really committed and the feedback so far has been really, really great. And like I said, so we were soliciting interest in this core stakeholder group during the AP meetings, those online surveys and those regional workshops. And we were, people could either indicate they were interested or folks could nominate people to, or recommend people to be on this core stakeholder group. So when we combined all of the different names that we had, we had 582 people either express interest or be recommended by somebody. So we had 582 potential people to fill 12 to 15 slots. So we had a little bit of work to do. And so the technical work group developed a really, I think, you know, thorough and deliberative process. We had a bunch of different metrics that we considered uh, using information that we collected through all of those different earlier stakeholder engagement opportunities. We had different weighting schemes that we could consider to apply to all of those different metrics and came out with a list of primary folks that we would target. And then if those folks couldn't participate, we had a list of alternative um, people to go to. And the goal was really to try to have a regionally balanced 
and stakeholder diverse composition. Uh, you know, we, and we try to achieve a minimum threshold for each region. We try to have three core stakeholder group members, three from each region and at least two for each different stakeholder type. And here you can see, this is the final sort of membership. We have 13 people on the core stakeholder group. This gives you a breakdown by region and a breakdown by stakeholder type. And just to go into the stakeholder type a little bit. So in the for hire, we want, you know, obviously we have party and charter boats. So we wanted to make sure we had at least one representative for the party industry, you know, for party boats and one representative for, for hire. Uh, I mean, for charter boats uh, under the private recreational, we wanted to make sure we had at least one representative from a private boat and then one representative from shore mode. Um, secondary markets, again, those, those cover things such as bait and tackle shops, um, you know, marine trades, um, um, man, you know, uh, tackle manufacturers, any of those sorts of other secondary markets, those, so those downstream effects to the recreational industry. And then within the other category, those includes uh, academia, NGOs, or coastwide or national, you know, uh, organizations. That's what co is covered in those in that other category. So I think we have a really strong group of representatives here. That's quite diverse. Um, we have a mixture of some AP members that are on the group. Some folks that are really new uh, to the process, uh, which is good. So we're not we're getting some new voices and some opinions and input from folks that we typically don't hear from. So I think we have a good mixture of people on this group. So they've already held our first, we've already held our first workshops and typically we would have tried to have done all of these workshops in person, but in order to continue to move this project forward, we know we needed for these first workshops, they were going to have to be held via webinar, which made things a little bit more challenging to get through everything that we needed to, but I think we, we ended up in a good spot. So our first workshop session one was held on June 14th and, um, you know, initially the. First topic was really just to introduce everybody to management strategy evaluation, our EAFM, you know, decision process, how we got to the, the project that we are, and just sort of introduce the process to the group. So that was sort of the initial part of that first workshop. But the primary focus was to develop this decision statement um, and it be a consensus decision statement from the entire core stakeholder group. And so this was really to establish a common understanding of what the focus of this management strategy evaluation are and what the expected outcomes might be. So certainly the board, when they chose, chose this decision or this question was gonna focus on recreational discards, but that's a really, can be a really broad topic. And as you'll see, when we get to alternatives and, and objectives, there are a lot of things to consider. And so this, Defining a decision statement here really helped us identify the bounds of the management strategy evaluation. So, for example, there was a lot of discussion about allocation issues or commercial minimum size limits and those sorts of things. And so it was so we had to be clear that those kinds of decisions and those kinds of considerations were not going to be part of this management strategy evaluation. Allocation discussions was one of the options uh, the council could have selected after that conceptual model development, but they decided not to use allocations as a particular point here. Again, we can evaluate at the end of this when the council and board makes their decisions on the summer flounder allocations between the commercial and recreational sector. We could use those decisions and help us inform the management strategy evaluation, but those outcomes and those decisions were not going to be considered here. So having this decision statement, um, I think was really helpful to the group to so that everybody had a common understanding. And you can see the decision statement on the right hand side. And I am going to read through it just to be clear, because it really sets up the stage for the rest of the input that we're that I'm going to provide for the discussion today. And so the decision statement that they came up with was to decide how to meet the challenges of satisfying the diverse groups of anglers engaged in the recreational fluke fishery by addressing discarding, discard mortality, and data quality, while allowing for meaningful access to the fishery, accounting for temporal and spatial differences in recreational mode availability, 
considering the impacts of size and male to female take ratios and achieving equity in, in recreational modes, given the bounds of what is viable, given the regulatory framework. So that's a mouthful, but to me, you can see the complexity of this issue. It sounds easy. Let's just deal with recreational discards, but there's all sorts of things within this decision statement from the diverse groups of, of, of anglers engaged in the fishery to um, discards and discards mor mortality and data to the spatial and temporal issues that we have to male and female considerations to mode specific av you know, availability. So there are so many components that we need to sort of weave and consider in this sort of generally simple sort of uh, management question that we're trying to get to. And so the core stakeholder group then use this decision statement uh, to help identify management objectives and, and alternatives. So we then went into our second session. This is still workshop one, but we had a second session on July 14th. And that workshop, we started off with an overview of one of the simulation models. We focused on the bioeconomic model here. So we gave an overview of how that model was being built and what, it, what types of information that model could provide, because really that's a new model that most folks aren't familiar with. So we thought it would be good to at least spend a little bit of time and introduce that model to them uh, early on. They're gonna get a lot more opportunity to review the models during our next workshop. So, and before we came to this workshop, we sent out, so all of the core stakeholders were asked to provide their own management objectives and alternatives. And we took all of the information that we took, got received from all of those other um, stakeholder engagement opportunities to come up with a comprehensive list of draft management objectives and alternatives to consider here. And so what we're looking at here in terms of management objectives, it's really, it's really to help understand what a successful recreational fishery would look like that minimizes discards and discards mortality, right? So that's the management, that's the broad management objective that we're trying to achieve. And so what are the different management objectives that we should be striving for through this management strategy evaluation? And so there were a number of them that came up, but these are the top five um, when you look from feedback from the core stakeholder group and you look at feedback from all of the other stakeholder, stakeholder input that we have. So the top five are, and they cover both social, economic, and biological implications. So the group, you know, stakeholders are interested in our broad range of management objectives here. So improve the quality of the angler experience, maximize the equity of the angler's experience, maximize stock sustainability, maximize the economic sustainability of the fishery and maximize the sustainability of participation in the fishery. And so those objectives are really broad. And so what we try to do then is within each management objective, right? Maximize the quality of the angler experience. Well, that could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And so we took the other feedback that we've received and sort of developed sub objectives that may you know, help us achieve this broader quality of the angler experience. And so these are just some of the sub objectives that I've identified here. I didn't put them all on the screen. I'm not gonna go through all of the management objectives. They're in your briefing book materials. Um, so, is, like I said, so we came up with these sub objectives and then we also developed possible metrics, right? So how can we determine whether or not we're being successful at achieving any of these objectives? So we tried to come up with some initial potential metrics that we would look at. So for example, one, one sub objective of the quality of an angler experience would be, would be the maximize the chances that a trip produces a legal fish. Right, so if everybody's allowed to take home a keeper fish, that should hopefully increase the quality of the angler experience. And so what can we look at in terms of whether or not we're achieving that particular objective? We can look at the change in the percent of trips where someone took home a keeper fish, right? So those are the things that we tried to do for all of the different management objectives, identify sub objectives that would sort of help you know, characterize what we mean by this broad objective and then identify potential metrics. Now, some of them, you know, we don't have a potential metric for. So there's one example there, maximize the quality of the recreational fishing experience. At, at least as of right now, we didn't come up with something to 
a specific metric to quantify what the quality of the recreational fishing experience may mean. Because again, that could be quite diverse across a number of different folks. So we don't have one specific metric potentially for that sub objective, but hopefully that gives you a good sense of types of things that we're considering here. Like I said, I'm just gonna go through the top three management objectives just to give you a sense. So the second objective is maximize the equity of an angler's experience. And so here we have, I'm just looking at, so minimize changes in regulations from year to year. You know, so that's one of those in terms of equity that we may want to look at. That could be a sub objective that we want to look at and how could we measure our success. One way would be just looking at the number of different regulatory changes over time and looking at what those trends and regulation changes might mean. But what you'll be able to see is across these different objectives, there's going to be a lot of competing um, a lot of competing interests, right? So in management objective one, which was sort of um, in regards to qual the quality of the angular experience, one of the options sub objectives was maximize the flexibility by customizing regulations by state. So that's one way to increase the quality. But when you wanna look at equity, one of the sub objectives here is minimize the difference in regulations between neighboring states, right? So there are competing interests across different objectives, but this is one of the benefits of doing the management strategy evaluation. We can look at what those trade-offs may mean, you know, giving as much flexibility to states or regions to craft regulations, what are those potential implications and vice versa, minimizing those different you know, regulations between neighboring states or between regions or across the coast and look at what those potential implications may mean. And then lastly, looking at objective three, which is maximize stock sustainability. Again, we have a number of sub objectives that we could look at here. Um, maximize regulatory compliance, for example, could be one sub objective to look at our, our abilities to maximize stock sustainability. And you could look at the number of violations, you know, per year within a, within a state or across, you know, no law enforcement, we could look at some different sort of metrics to evaluate regulatory compliance. So those are the examples that I wanted to give here. Those are our broad sort of management objectives. And then we had the core group and all of our stakeholder engagement. We came up with these list of alternatives and strategies that we would implement to achieve those broad management goals, right? So these are our options and our tools and the actions that we may implement at the end of this management strategy evaluation to achieve our goals that we've identified. And all, not, not all of these, but so these alternatives and strategies though will be evaluated through simulation models. So we'll evaluate the implications from a biological, from an economic, from a social implications. We can evaluate all of these different alternatives and strategies, see what those trade-offs are and see how they ultimately result in meeting those manage management objectives that we've defined. And so when we take all of the feedback that we've received, we came up with 15 different alternative categories. So all of these different um, sort of options and management tools that we may wanna consider broke down into these 15 different categories. So it's a little overwhelming on some regards, but to me it was, it was really interesting to see these because again, this is an ecosystem um, project and so we have some alternatives here that we may think about that really cover the, the spectrum of ecosystem issues that we have. Certainly our traditional things such as size, season, and possession limits, you know, we certainly are gonna to wanna to consider those, but looking at some other issues such as gear and tackle regulations or habitat or forage fish or data collection, all of these things, other sort of ecosystem dynamics that may influence our ability to, you know, increase angler satisfaction, minimize recreational discards, all of those things, what are those other components that we also may wanna consider? And so these are these broad alternative categories that we have. And then within each 
alternative category, there are very specific options, right? That we may want to consider. So I'm just, again, I'm not going to go through all 15 of these. I'm just going to go through three of them just to give you some examples of what we're looking at. So under size limits, right? There are a number of combinations of minimum or maximum or a total trip size that we could consider. We could look at um, changes to minimum size limits, you know, starting at 15, 16, 17, or 18 inches. What's that minimum size? We could look at maximum size limit options. We could look at slot limits. We could look at total length limit options. We could have no limit. We may want to consider the, the models that we are developing, particularly the biological model. We'll have the ability to evaluate things by sex potentially. Um, it's certainly set up that way, whether or not we can, how well we can evaluate some of those things when we get into it, we'll see. But maybe we can evaluate um, size limit, you know, issues by, by sex ratio. So considering sex ratios when we think about our minimum size limits is certainly something we're going to want to consider here. Uh, this came up, you know, a lot, a lot of feedback that we got were discard allowances, right? So maybe there are different things that we would want to consider in, in regards to different options when it comes to actual number of discards that you may want to allow on a particular trip or within a particular season, or maybe you are going to try to have um, discards within a particular length. Again, thinking about slot limits or something like that or you would allow for um, retentions of a discard, like if a fish was gut hooked, right? So maybe there's an opportunity there for anglers to take home that fish that they would otherwise have to throw back that's gonna be dead, but maybe there's opportunities for some sort of allowances for discarding under specific situations. So these are different options we could consider here under discard allowances under spatial considerations, right? There are a whole host of things we may want to consider in regards to spatial scale. So we could look at evaluating these, evaluating measures at a coastwide level, at a state. We could look at regions. So within, you know, across states, we could also potentially look at regions within states. I know some states have talked about that. Um, we could also evaluate protected or closed areas. So I think there's different spatial considerations that we can also evaluate here in terms of how beneficial um, some of these management measures may be. And so the just to lay out sort of next steps here, you know, so far the project has been progressing on schedule. So the, and I'll, the next slide has a timetable of expectations going forward. I think we're on track to complete the project as we've sort of identified so far. And so our timeline is very similar to what I've previously presented to the council. Um, uh, the technical work group and the modeling subgroup are scheduled to meet a number of times in September. We're going to take your feedback today and sort of really begin to get into the modeling component of this. So now that we're beyond sort of the stakeholder input, we're going to start taking all of that information and start running through models and simulation work. You know, as you've seen here, there's a lot of alternatives here for consideration. And so the one of the first projects for the technical work group is to at least identify some initial priorities that we're going to want to evaluate for analysis. And we can present those results to the core group at their next workshop and get some feedback. Um, some of our previous uh, presentations that I've made to the council, I had talked about after the core stakeholder group would meet, we would have a committee meeting and a meeting with a subgroup of the board to sort of help bring that stakeholder feedback before we came to the full council and board meeting. Um, but actually, when I looked at the committee membership for the Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee and the membership for the Summer Founders Cup and Black Sea Bass Committee, when you take those two committees, it's essentially the entire council. And then when you would bring in some members of the board, we would have most of the managers in one room anyway. So when we figured it be more efficient to just get you all together instead of having this additional step. We're still giving you all an opportunity to weigh in on this and check in. So I think there's, I don't think we're missing anything by skipping that initial step that I thought we would plan for. 
Um, but I will note that committee leadership, the, the chair of the EOP and some of founders got Black Sea Bass Committee and the board chair have been invited and participate in almost all of our technical work group calls and different workshops. So they have been very engaged and they will continue to be invited. So leadership will still be engaged in the process throughout. And so the next step is, like I said, the technical work group's gonna start doing some modeling work. We're gonna get the core group together and uh, sometime in November, I'm finalizing those dates right now so that we can get present sort of what these models can produce, what sort of information can we show given some initial priorities that we've evaluated, and this will come back to the council and board in December. And so here's just a quick run through of the timeline, everything in orange we've completed. I said we've been working on this for quite a while already. The next four months or so is really going to be getting into that simulation model development on some initial priorities, getting some feedback then from the technical, for, I mean, from the core stakeholder group and the council on board by the end of the year. We'll take that feedback and continue with model development and sort of refine all of those, all of that feedback to develop final results. And we're looking to present the final results to you all sometime, you know, April to June timeframe. We, we want to get it to you all before your August meeting of next year so that you have some information to begin to move forward as you're starting to move forward with specifications and thinking about recreational management to help inform the 2023 fishery. You'll have that information early on next year to help with that process. And I also wanted to bring up um, sort of this intersection with the management strategy evaluation and the recreational reform initiative and specifically the harvest control rule. I know there we've had some internal quest, you know, discussions with staff. I know I've been asked questions and I think it's come up at the previous council meetings like how are all these actions and these big initiatives that we're working on? How are all of these things going to fit together? Right? We have a lot going on. Um, and that, you know, these projects are designed to address specific and different issues, but all of these projects are really intended to improve recreational fisheries management and our management implementation, right? So our implementation of management measures that help provide some stability and sustainability to both our, you know, stocks and to our fisheries. And so there is this common interconnected goal. And so there is probably a, an opportunity here to use these different processes and analyses that we have and the outcomes that we're gonna present, you know, to inform each other. And so I give some specific examples here where once the FMAT and PDT begin to think about what management measures may be in those different bins, uh, depending upon when those alternatives, you know, and, and management measures are being developed, we could feed them into this management strategy evaluation process, and we could evaluate them at least for summer flounder in terms of what those implications may mean for discards or what they may mean from an economic and biological perspective. So we could do some evaluations to help inform the harvest control rule process. We could utilize that again for summer flounder within our management strategy evaluation process. This was discussed earlier by Savannah and Julia. One of the models for our management strategy evaluation is being the bioeconomic model specifically is being considered by the FMAT and PDT to help identify what those management measures should be at those different bins. And so there's clearly then some overlap there in terms of a model that's being specifically developed for our management strategy evaluation but could have application to the harvest control rule. Um, you know, there is considerations for expanding that model. I, you know, I think the, the developer of that model is working on including black sea bass in that. But again, the focus of this model is to inform the management strategy evaluation. And so I think, you know, thinking about priorities and, and how things may play out, I think is gonna be really important. And then a, another way these things can become intersected, again, I think Julia had noted that there's gonna be a continued sort of evaluation of the harvest control rule performance. 
right? How are the management measures that you have in those different bins? How are they achieving the objectives that you identify through the harvest control rule process? And so maybe you, we could utilize this management strategy evaluation process to inform that evaluation for the harvest control rule. So there's a lot of areas here for intersections. The timelines are not completely aligned in terms of how these two things could inform each other. Um, and again, you know, the models that we are creating for this management strategy evaluation are being tailored to summer flounder and our needs for the management strategy evaluation. So we don't want to direct too much effort in terms of moving that away to specifically deal with the harvest control rule. So, you know, there are a lot of sort of moving parts and implications depending on how much intersection there is uh, across these two different projects. So really the goals today, you know, I presented just quickly here and I wouldn't say my presentation was very quick, but um, I didn't go into all of the different draft management objectives and alternatives that are in your briefing book. And I'm not looking for the council and board to say, yeah, we want a, you know, a 14 inch summer flounder or a slot limit with this size and a possession limit of three fish and these kinds of seasons, not looking for that specific kind of feedback, but are the, those five um, broad objectives, management objectives that I've outlined, those 14 different alternatives and all of the different options under there, does that capture the range that you all are thinking about? Or is there something in there that's missing? Or are we considering something within that list that you all are like, nope, we, we don't want any information on X, Y, or Z. So is there something we're missing and we should add for the consideration? Or is there something that's currently on the list that you all have no interest in us considering? Otherwise, we'll take that broad feedback. If you agree with those objectives and alternatives that we have, we as the technical work group and the core stakeholder group are really gonna refine those lists, right? We're not gonna be able to analyze all of that because we don't have the data, we don't have the time, and they may not be a priority to stakeholders and to managers to evaluate. And so that list is gonna be much smaller the next time we present this information to you in December. And so right now we just want a broad framework in which to evaluate things from so that we can draw from any of those potential sources of information and options and evaluate those. So that's really what I'm looking for now because these objectives and alternatives are gonna be further refined. They are gonna be prioritized by you all in December. And so that's the feedback on the management strategy evaluation. And then lastly, if we need to discuss sort of this intersection of management strategy evaluation and rec reform and how these things may intersect and how those priorities may lay out and the timing of those two different actions. And again, I draw your attention to the summer flounder management strategy evaluation page where there's a whole lot more information. There's a lot of stuff happening with the project. Um, and I would just lastly say thanks to Thanks to Tony and Peter and Adam for their engagement. They've really been helpful through this project so far. They participated on tons of the calls and tons of the workshops and their input has been really valuable. So I appreciate that. It's good to have management um, involved and you know, provide a, a check-in for some of these you know, projects that we're thinking about. So with that, I'll take any questions and, and leave this slide up for, for discussion. Thanks. Yeah, Brandon, thanks so much for that. Um, ton of information. Uh, you did an excellent job. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation and the, uh, and the update to where we are um, on this project. Sometimes, sometimes when, when I listen to all this stuff, I think about the good old days when I used to be like on an electrofishing boat, you know, sampling like uh, smallmouth bass in some river somewhere, but um, this is this is all really 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 good work, and I know we have some questions coming from uh, members of the council and the board. So I'm going to go back to I'm going to go to Joe Semino to to start. Uh, your your hands up first, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I was I was hoping Brandon could explain. I I, I certainly th this early in the game, and I I got to listen in to to some of the public hearings. Um, I, I don't have anything that I would like to see added or removed, but 
I did have a question on on some of the things that we would like to see modeled. Um, we we may not have a lot of data to do that, right? So I was kind of curious on how during this process, um, you know, you you can come back to us and explain the uncertainty of that type of modeling and and helping whittle things down. And um, I, I really haven't been through this process much. I've seen it a little bit on the outside with. Northeast Fishery Science Center and some great big stuff, but um, you know, just just to the extent of, does the group working on this think it's uh, that the modeling is appropriate or that the output is is robust enough that it has value? I'm just curious on how you know how that come how that's brought back to us. Thanks. Yeah, those are all good questions, Joe. And thankfully, uh, when we get together in December, you won't have to hear me talk about it. You can hear it from the modeling folks and folks much smarter than than I on those particular things. So, you know, I think certainly I think from a broad perspective, I think from both the biological model and the economic model, I think we have the the basis to conduct very solid um analysis and evaluations. Now, depending on what of all of those different alternatives, you know, what things we really want to, you know, begin to get into, you know, then I think, you know, what data we do have, how, how informative is in that, is that information? Is it old? Is it representative of the code? You know, we'll get into all of those discussions, I think, as we begin to really refine what those objectives and strategies that we're going to evaluate will be. Some of them we will not be able to explicitly model. Some of them I think we'll be able to model sort of as a proxy. I think we can, we're going to be able to model some of the uncertainty on a particular um, issue. Um, you know, so I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but I, I mean, I think we have both really strong, you know, Biological information, certainly at a coastwide level, at a regional level, and in some places at a state level. You know, if we start to refine them within modes and within waves and all of those kinds of things, you know, as we all know, those things get a little bit more shaky, but I think we can evaluate those. So I think we have really good biological information. I think we have really good economic information that's been used to inform and set up the current economic model that we have. So Again, I think it depends on where we ultimately go, but I think we're going to be able to evaluate the uncertainty and give that information to you to let you know how uncertain a particular outcome or trade off or what the results may mean. I think we're going to be able to present that kind of information to you. Anything on a follow up, Joe? No, just thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. Looking forward yeah, okay, to this. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Michelle Duvall, I think I think you're next. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Brandon, for that full awesome presentation. Um, really appreciate the detail that's on the project webpage as well. It's been really nice to be able to sort of check in and see how things are going on there. Um, so I, I just had, you know, I agree with Joe. There's no, nothing that I would recommend deleting or adding at this point. I, maybe just one comment on the, um, you know, those 15 different alternatives. Um, one, the one on data collection. I noticed that one of the, I think, bullet points under there was augmented MRIP, and I was just going to suggest that um, there's a new National Academy study that has been recently released and. There's a chapter in there that focuses on, um, you know, tools to augment MRIP. So I'd encourage you guys to look at that as you move forward. And then, you know, I know that this has been, um, you know, the, the recreational community is extremely diverse, as you know, you've stated repeatedly throughout your presentation. There's a lot of nuances to, you know, what what folks would like to see from their, you know, fishing experiences. And I guess I'm, I'm hoping you can help me understand 1 of these nuances, which is under that. 1st, management objective of maximize the quality of the angler experience. And I. You know, 1 of the sub objectives is maximize the quality of the recreational fishing experience. So I was just 
wondering if you could maybe help me understand, you know, the, the nuanced difference between that objective and then that sub objective. Thanks. Yeah, no, th th thanks, Michelle, on the information regarding the National Academy of Sciences. I think that's that'll be really helpful. And I, and then we are like, and we are considering, I would say, more than just obviously MREP is going to be a critical piece of the information that we have, but I think we can also account for uncertainties and sort of, you know, um, some of the issues surrounding MRIP, I think that's going to be a, certainly a focal question or analysis that will sort of run. But I think we're also thinking about other information that's available. And, and certainly our core stakeholder group has made us aware of some other studies and, in, and data that may be available that we can use in the different models that we have. And so I think that will be, you know, a critical component to the analysis, is the analysis that we do. Um, in regards to the nuances, uh, maybe there's, let me, if I can go back and pull up that specific slide, Michelle. No, that's not it. So the qual, yeah, I mean, so this is really hard to, everybody sort of talked about the, the quality of the Angular experience and actually, and these aren't even all of the sub objectives that we've identified potentially to that would be part of the quality um, of the Angular experience. I guess those, I guess those two things are very much, I guess the, they are the same thing. Maybe we just miss pulling some of these out maybe, or maybe the specific language was a little bit different in some of the feedback that we got. So th these were right quality of the experience. Uh, and I had said during my talk can be very different to very different, you know, to lots of different people. And so there are lots of, and so we tried to look at the other pieces of feedback that we got to understand what quality may mean to different people. And I said, I think for the most part, we've tried to pull those into here. And so looking, I would say the most common response was the quality of the angler experience is being able to bring home a fish, right? That's probably the number one thing is being able to bring home a fish. And so that's the main portion of the quality of the experience. Some of these other things, you know, the ability to keep a trophy fish, depending on how size limits are set up, um, achieving the, the possession limits, you know, so somebody retaining three fish or five fish, depending on where you're at, what state you're in, all of those different things are other areas we could evaluate. We tried to come up with metrics to consider those. Maybe that's why I left that one blank uh, there because the quality of the experience is all of these other sort of sub objectives. So maybe I just, I just missed that or the language was slightly different somewhere in our different pulling of, of pieces of information. So maybe the new one, maybe there is no nuance there. I just maybe missed something. Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate the response. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Um, so I guess, you know, based on what you just said, uh, catching fish, catching flounder is different from being, you know, there, there's more interest in being able to bring something home. Um, that kind of resonates in in my head um, with you know some of the other species we manage, but you know that's that's good feedback from the public um, and the uh, the core group. So um, thanks for that uh, back and forth. I have three uh, four hands up right now. I'm going to go to Chris Bad Savage and then Adam Nowalski. Uh, I'll come to you next. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brandon, for the uh, presentation. Um, I mean, kind of along similar lines that Michelle was talking about in terms of the, not, not just the nuances, but the competing interests that you uh, that you highlighted um, uh, were. But at the end, where it all really boils down is the, the main thing people are most interested in is uh, you know ca catching a fish that they can keep. Um, it looks like the work group talked about you know a variety of different maximum and minimum size limits and, and different bag limits, you know, uh, to, um, you know, try to try to cover, cover these, these competing interests. Uh, was there any discussion by the work group as far as something I've brought up before, uh, where you have an option of different size and bag combinations, um, you know, 
you know, to where you could have a higher minimum size limit and a higher bag limit or a lower minimum size limit and a lower bag limit that, that covers that, that difference in availability of summer flounder, which you know, varies among states or even varies in a state versus whether you're fishing closer to shore or fishing offshore um, to, to try to get to that. And wh whether that something like that is kind of, it fits in the different range of alternatives that the uh, that that the uh, the work group has, has talked about, and I mean it'd be interesting to see if if that if that's something that they're if if it is you know, especially because you know if, if 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 it's not sustainable then you know then then the the quality of the fishing experience uh, goes down if the if there's fewer fish to catch because we're over harvesting. So, anyways, um, just just wondering about how if that's been discussed and how that fits into the different range of alternatives. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. I, I, first, you know, getting to the competing interests there, are, you know, I think that's going to be one of the challenges, but I think that's also one of the benefits of this approach that we'll be able to evaluate what those, those trade-offs may mean if you select one thing or a combination of things and what those implications may mean for for other components <clears throat> to your specific question in regards to you know a higher bag with higher size limits or or you know lower bag with low I, I wouldn't say that that was explicitly talked about but i think it's within the range of what we could consider one of the things that the core group did talk about were were something like you know, you would be able to have like one fish at a lower size limit, right? Whatever that may be, you know, 14 inches or 15 inches, right? So one fish at a smaller size and then, uh, you know, two fish, and I'm just throwing these out as examples, two fish at 18 inches or 19 inches, right? So you had the ability to, for anglers and regardless of potentially, particularly, I think they were thinking about that, you could apply that across multiple states because it would allow folks if you lowered that size limit to take home you know the, increase the opportunity to take home a fish but then you would have sort of these larger size limits then on those remaining fish um, where and then folks could still retain large fish if they wanted to if they wanted that trophy fish and so I, there was a lot of feedback talking about those kinds of combinations uh, a one fish at a smaller fit one fish at a smaller fish and maybe something more at a larger fish. So it sort of aligned along the lines of what you were mentioning, but slight, you know, the nuances are slightly different, but I certainly think your, your specific example is something we could evaluate. I think it's within the range of things that we could consider. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. Thanks, Brendan. Um, Appreciate that. I'm going to go next to uh, Chairman Nowalski. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, questions on two elements here. Uh, one with regards to the intersection of the harvest control rule work and the management strategy evaluation. Do you think, given uh, that one of the impetuses for this MSC was that recreational or discards in the entire fishery, uh, and particularly on the recreational side, the mortality from that was starting to exceed the mortality from the harvest, uh, which is the one of the reasons for going through this process to address rec discards, uh, and that leading to a lot of the issues with higher size limits and a lot of the rec reform efforts uh, addressing some of the issues there as well. Is there a place where, given the discussion this morning, where it was clear that a focus needs to be on developing measures for steps, is there an intersection that could occur where the working group you have formed for this MSC could potentially help jumpstart the discussion of the measures in various steps? Uh, and with regards to the alternatives and strategies that you have here, uh, our New Jersey Bureau of Marine Fisheries staff has been working on consideration of a combination slot limit 
plus a minimum size limit. So you could take one or two fish between 17 and 18 inches, uh, plus one or two fish over 18 inches uh, with some different ranges for the upper and lower bounds there. I know that's now in conversation with uh, the ASMFC um, technical committee. Uh, under alternatives and strategy, you mention slot limits, but in table three, you don't actually have slot limit listed as a potential alternative option. So is an idea like what's being looked at by the technical committee at the ASMFC as I described it uh, within the bounds of consideration with these potential alternative options, or do you feel that's something I would would need to formally request be added here today. Thanks, Adam. Uh, in regards to your first question in, in the <laughs> in regards to the harvest control rule. And so what where I, I personally think I, you know I think the clearly the FMAN PDT need to given their goals and objectives for their work and how they may assign management measures to the different bins that they have. I think that will clearly be up to them. Then they're going to potentially use a model that we're thinking about or that we're using utilizing for this project. They may help they may use that to help identify what those measures are. Where I think this management strategy evaluation could help help with that project is if they've identified what those management measures may be. Um, within the different bins, again, specific to summer flounder, because that's all this management strategy evaluation generally is really dealing with. Um, we could evaluate then what those sort of outcomes and potential implications may mean from a discarding perspective, from a biological perspective, right? We could sort of run through some simulations looking at those different management um, options under the different bins and look at what those potential outcomes may mean. So that's where I think this management strategy evaluation could help with the harvest control rule and, and identifying what those measures may mean at the different bins. Um, in regards to the slot, yeah, I mean, I think it was consciously that we, there was a lot of discussion with, within the core group about slot limits like a, and I'm talking about and, and what slot limits actually mean or what they don't mean. And so, you know, these slot limits of like, like you have for, um, for red drum, right? There's a very clear, you know, anything under that size needs to be released, anything over a particular, or even now for striped bass, right? You all, I think, can have slot limits generally in place for striped bass. And so, the core group talked a lot about that and not having not having something like that um, because of you know the ability to retain a bigger fish or there were concerns that having a slot fish may in, introduce additional discards. But I think the scenario that you are talking about, and I talked to the folks in New Jersey about what they're considering. I think it aligns in some regards to some of the other options that our core group is talking about, right? A, a lower possession limit for a smaller fish and a different uh, possession limit for some sort of larger fish and above. And so I think to me, that's, an, we could go back to the core group to talk about that, but I think what you are suggesting, Adam, is within the bounds of the types of things that we can consider and we are, I think, already considering in terms of what we could analyze. So um, I don't think it's, unless you're thinking about something else, like I said, like a true slot limit like you have for striped bass or, or red drum, um, I said that the, the core stakeholder group at least mentioned that they were not interested in, they had concerns about that sort of approach, but something like you're talking about and what New Jersey's thinking about, I think is within the realm of what we would consider. All right, thanks for that, uh, Adam and Brandon. Um, next, I'm going to go to Shanna. Go ahead, Shanna, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Brandon. I, I am following this process with a lot of excitement. I think that 
um, MSEs are kind of one of the waves of the future. So I really appreciate your presentation. I think you've been doing a really great job and I, I continue to be excited to see where all of this goes. Um, so my question relates to one of the alternatives that probably doesn't surprise anyone why I would be asking this question. Um, but I was kind of curious as to what the intent was on the final alternative, which is regulating uh, forage fish status. Um, I was kind of just sort of thinking through exactly, you know, what we're trying to get at here. Are we looking to sustain the prey species listed to provide for summer flounder within the system? Um, and I'm sort of framing that in the context of thinking through um, being part of like a mini MSE, I guess I would consider it, which was ASMFC's uh, Ecosystem Management Objectives Workshop um, and sitting through the ecosystem reference points process. Um, this kind of struck me, this specific alternative sort of struck me as something that kind of needs an MSE process in itself. Um, so I was sort of curious to see what the intent was here and maybe where the intersection with this specific alternative was with some of the management objectives overall. Thanks, Shanna. That's a good question. <clears throat> and I don't know, you know, we certainly haven't sort of, we within the technical group or certainly not within the core group has certainly fleshed out what specifically that may mean because I agree that that one issue alone or even within sort of the habitat um, alternatives, you know, I think could you could do a full blown MSC on those and take up, you know, a lot of considerations. I think um you know, I think they were, I think the feedback they were getting from stakeholders are that, and which was good, again, because we're thinking about these things as in an ecosystem context is, you know, there are these other drivers, right, that are going on that are going to influence population dynamics and fish availability and all of those sorts of things. And so I think there was the, the feedback specific to the forage was there are these other sort of systems going on and, and how we actually may model some of those. I think some of these may just be, you know, where we could evaluate sort of summer flounder productivity, for example, um, if prey abundance um, or habitat uh, quality or um, availability sort of changes, it goes up or goes down, we could probably sort of model that through it changes in stock productivity through some sort of mechanism. And I'll leave that to the modelers and the smarter folks on the group to sort of evaluate how we may want to consider that. So I think it's going to be more probably like forcing functions to evaluate what sort of these other forces, you know, what some of these other ecosystem forces may mean and how they can have some implications on, on stock productivity and then ultimately what that means from actual management um, implications. So I don't know if I directly answered, you know, I think those are, those are areas that the technical work groups are really going to have to think through how we consider some of those less, um, concrete sort of ecosystem drivers. All right, thanks, Brandon. Um, and thanks for your question, Shanna. Uh, I wanna go next to Tony Delernia, and then I'd like to wrap this up so we can all take a lunch break. Um, go ahead, Tony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Folks who have been following me on the council over the years have noticed that I've been very much against slot limits for summer flounder, scuff, and black sea bass. But I think the New Jersey idea is exactly what we should be considering. The New Jersey idea of where there's a slot limit with an allowance for a trophy sea fish, I think will go, will go very far along towards achieving our goals of management and still allowing for uh, the retention of a large fish. So uh, when I first heard it, I liked it. The more I've thought about it, I love it. I encourage the uh, council to uh, continue to pursue, and I encourage the state of New Jersey to continue to pursue the development of that concept. Thank you, sir. All right, thanks, Tony. 
I appreciate the, uh, your comments. So, you know, looking at the meeting goals for today, uh, there was a ton of information presented and Brandon, you did an amazing job um, getting through that. Um, I didn't hear, at least unless I missed it, uh, whether there's added or deleted options uh, from what Brandon presented. So if there aren't any added or, or deleted options, I'm assuming that the group, uh, both the council and the board are comfortable with moving forward and, and having this develop further. And my notes uh, here indicate that there are, there's no real need for a motion at this time, unless there's disagreement in that case. Um, so, Brandon, let me ask you, I know we had a lot of questions and, and a lot of back and forth. Are we good to moving forward at this point? Or do you need something more formal from uh, both the both the board and the council? No, I think I got what I needed. My general sense is that you all are, are okay with the sort of the objectives and alternatives that we that we will move forward with. You'll see a much more refined list in December. And, and I think, you know, there is where you're gonna really be wanting wanting to decide what things do we really want to spend more time evaluating and considering. And so I think at this point I got the feedback gotcha. and I have some of the, you know, some of the specifics that you all talked about. And I'll be sure to raise those with the technical work group and core team. So I think I have what I need. So thanks. Okay, good. Okay. Um, is there any public comment on what was presented? Any feedback from the public? Greg Domenico, go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Uh, just to, to add in, uh, I'm part of the working group and uh, happy to do it, uh, but do not think that the forage consideration has anything to do with recreational uh, uh, eliminating or reducing recreational discards, and I don't think it has anything to do with the goals and objectives that we so far have decided upon. So, I would certainly uh, voice my opinion in opposition to including forage. Thank you. All right, thanks for that comment, Greg. Um, next, I have Mike. Uh, I always I always mess up your name, Mike. Playa, Playa, Playa. There you go. Thank you. Um, as a member of the core group, as well as an, an uh, advisor on all of the species being considered for the uh, uh, recreational reform initiative, um, I would like to urge the council to take advantage of the resources that it has available to it um, in in developing a recreational reform initiative and, and as well as this uh, objective of, of reducing recreational discards in, in the summer farm fishery. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comment. Um, I'm gonna go next, I have James Fletcher. Go ahead, James. Will we ever discuss a total length retention with no discards for recreational fishermen? I've been pushing this for more than 15 years off and on. When will it ever be discussed or will it ever be discussed? Thank you. Yeah, Brandon, let me ask you, is that anything that's been talked about? Yep, th thanks, Mr. Chairman. It's it's a specific option within the alternatives within the size limit. Um, you know, there was interest uh, by the core stakeholder group to at least evaluate it and look at it. So um, a, some sort of total total length limit, I'm not suggesting that it would also come with no discarding, but you know, no discards is one of the options under those discard alternatives as well. So both of those are things that are on the list of things for consideration. And I said, the core group certainly talked about interest in evaluating a, a total length limit, so. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, 
Okay, uh, Jim, your hand's still up. Did you have a feed uh, follow up? Okay, I see your hand just went down. I'm going to go to, it looks like Julie Evans. Go ahead, Julie. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak. I represent the town of East Hamptons Fisheries Advisory Committee, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm really happy um, to see the, this idea being um, extended and hopefully we'll come to more interesting conclusions on how to handle our recreational fishery. Um, one thing though, um, I, I, you know, as a, as a local captain myself, the for hire industry gets kind of um, not a lot of uh, attention paid to it. So um, I would like to see more attention paid to the for hire industry, which they really are mostly commercial fishermen who um, are now, you know, serving the public as um, in the charter boat capacity. And they have suffered just as much as any other group during the COVID um, lockdown. Um, so if, if you know, we could um, pay more attention to those four higher pe people um, all up and down the coast, but, you know, as I represent East Hampton, it is Montauk, which is, you know, a, a very um, important industry here. And um, we would like to see our fair share of fish. So basically that's what we're looking for so thank you very much i appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak yeah thanks julie and thanks for um being part of our meeting today it's good to hear from you um is there anyone else from the public before i go back to the council and the board i don't see any other hands at this time so i'm going to go well, let me ask, is there anyone that's just on the phone that wants to offer comment? If you can just speak up. I know some people are just on the phone and they can't raise their hand. I don't think there's very many, but um, I just wanted to make sure I cleared, cleared the decks on that. Um, I don't see anybody at this time. So let me come back to the board for last comments. Um, and to the council for last comments, uh, we're going to go. I want to go next to Peter defer. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to take this opportunity as the chair of the EOP committee to uh, to commend Brandon on his work personally and the entire group on uh, on forging through this, particularly under difficult circumstances when we all know that engaging and involving people who are not on the council. Um, in this effort is not only necessary, but has been difficult over the last 12 months. Brandon has done just an outstanding job and and as the committee chair under which this activity has been uh, carried out, I just want to commend him and I want the entire council to know what a great job he has done and I expect it will continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And I can't say enough about Brandon. I'm, I'm probably going to have to go back and listen. To this presentation about three or four times to, to soak it all in. Um, there's a lot of information there, but you know, Brandon's done a, a tremendous job given the uh, the struggles that we've all had uh, as far as getting together with people to have these debates and discussions. So I appreciate your comments, uh, Peter. Uh, I'm going to end. I want to end this session with um, comments or questions or whatever. You know, um, from Adam, uh, our chairman Adam Nawalski from the board, and then we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, while everybody's piling on the comments to Brandon, I just have to offer he left me behind here in New Jersey. So, uh, but thanks for all the great work he's doing here at the council level now. Uh, what Brandon is the intersection of this group's work with enforcement? We've got this range of alternatives here now. Uh, the council and the board have weighed in today with their implicit uh, acknowledgement of leaving them in by not voicing opposition to any of them. Uh, but what good is spending that group's time, spending the council and the board's time if enforcement is ultimately going to say something? There's no way one of these choices could be implemented. So how is that being taken into account with these alternatives being discussed? 
Yeah, that's a good a good point, Adam. I know the work group has talked about enforcement components um, sort of early on in the process. You know, I'm not opposed. I, I don't know the best way to get the intersection of that. Um, you know, maybe reaching out to you know the commission's law enforcement folks and and some of NOAA. Noah's law enforcement folks to have them engaged at some point. I mean, because now that we're starting to dig, you know, now we're going to start to get down and refine some of these alternatives and look at very specific things. I think now is the time to start thinking about some of those um, options. And so, and you know, we don't want to bring them in at the end after we've done all of this work and they say, yeah, no, that's going to work. Uh, sorry. Um, so I do think we want to bring them in at some point. Um, but I, I don't have a clear or specific answer for you now, other than that, that it's a good point. I'll certainly bring it up with the work group and then I can talk with folks to see how best to engage, you know, in some component of enforcement within the discussions. Yeah, thanks, Brandon, um, for that. And thanks, Adam, for your question. I just want to remind you, Adam, that. Brandon used to work for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources many, many, many years ago, and we lost him to New Jersey. So um, I would do anything to get him back, but it's great to have him uh, as part of our discussions at the council. Uh, you know, so he's doing an excellent job. Tony Delerni, I've got you next with your hand up. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I really have to uh, emphasize what Adam just brought up. Recall when uh, Dewey Hemelwright, myself, and Steve Hines, we ran a law enforcement committee meeting, uh, a workshop actually, which was attended by the Northeast uh, Office or Law Enforcement Office from the Northeast region and all the state uh, law enforcement agencies on the enforceability of regulations. And one of them was the enforceability or the recommendation that we asked the South Atlantic Council to allow the filleting of mahis uh, that are caught north of uh, Cape Hatteras. And we went down to the council, Dewey and I went down to the council and we asked them and they agreed. And everything was great and happy and we were all skipping down the lane together, holding hands in hand. Then the Southeast Office of Law Enforcement came up and said, oh, no good, we can't enforce this, we don't like that. And all of a sudden the council said, well, never mind. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, an issue that was worked on for three years went uh, down the drain. And so. Uh, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have someone from the office of law enforcement, and actually not the regional office. I would suggest that from the uh, Silver Springs office participate in this work. Otherwise, uh, you may end up uh, some of the recommendations may end up the same way the mahi fillet requests went. Thanks. I'll mute myself. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. No, I appreciate that, and I, I don't necessarily know that. I think it's that was a good comment, and Brandon can certainly take that under consideration. Uh, for, you know, the working forward. I don't see any more hands at this time. We've had a really good debate um, or discussion, I guess is more less than a, not such a debate, but a discussion. And from what I'm hearing, there are no additions uh, or deletions to the options presented. And so Brandon, uh, I'll ask you one last time. Is there anything more that you need um, from the board? And the council at this time before we break for lunch. Nope, that's it for me. I appreciate the time today. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so let's do this. Um, thanks everybody for your participation in the discussion. It is a little, it's 118. Let's go ahead and break until two o'clock if that's okay with everyone. And we'll come back um, at two o'clock to take up the rest of our agenda for this afternoon. It gives everybody. 40 minutes to go have lunch and and take a little break from from the meetings um, from this morning. So um, thanks everyone again, and I'll we'll come we'll come back right at two o'clock on the on the nose. Thanks. <laughs>